Uh, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 16, so please turn to Luke 16. I'm so sorry to hear about uh, Peter. Uh, boy, this, this world is uh, a rough patch, isn't it? It's the pilgrim's progress getting, getting through. We have good days, thank the Lord. The Lord's good, but uh, uh, there's never a uh, trial too far down the road. That's for sure. God, God is good and compassionate, and we can, we can trust him. Arriving at uh, chapter 16 of the Gospel of Luke, we find ourselves in the midst of, of several chapters beginning in chapter 13 and extending through chapter 19, uh, which contain a, a series of parables uh, the Lord used in his teaching. Uh, you know that. You know um, how prone he was to uh, tell a story to illustrate uh, important spiritual Truth. Some of the parables are directed at the disciples, uh, some at uh, enthusiasts who are considering uh, becoming a disciple, and others are aimed squarely at the religious leaders of the Jews who opposed him. Chapter 15, uh, our last chapter, consisted of three parables uh, with a common and wonderful theme, which was God's joy. Uh, at a lost sinner being found. Uh, and now in chapter 16, the Lord will return to a favorite topic of his, <clears throat> money and its proper place in a person's life, specifically in our passage today as it pertains to a disciple's preparation for the future. I hope it doesn't make any of us uncomfortable that's not my intent, but it emphasizes how one's use of money uh, both reflects and illustrates <clears throat> how astute a person is or is not in relation to the future. I want us to <clears throat> have that in our minds as we study the chapter, that this is largely about money, not just money, but uh, largely about money, and especially as it relates to the future, what's ahead uh, for each of us. The parable of the shrewd manager, uh, which is the subject of our passage today, is uh, not the easiest parable to interpret. In fact, many months ago when I was considering what are we going to teach next, what book, um, in considering the Gospel of Luke. Uh, it was this chapter <laughs> that uh, was daunting uh, for me. If I teach the Gospel of Luke, I'm going to have to teach uh, chapter 16. So I've read commentators who said, I don't see the challenge with, <laughs> with this. But um, anyway, uh, uh, I recovered from that, and I think we'll be able to see uh, that Jesus is using this story of a shrewd man of the world uh, to teach us to be shrewd ourselves in matters far more noble and important. So let's read uh, the first 13 verses of Luke chapter 16. Now Jesus was also saying to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager, and this manager was reported to him as squandering his possessions. And he called him and said to him, What is this I hear about you? Uh, give an accounting of your management, for you can no longer be managers. He fired him. Uh, the manager said to himself, What shall I do since my master is taking the management away from me? I am not strong enough to dig. I am ashamed to beg. I know what I shall do, so that when I am removed from the management, people will welcome me into their homes. And he summoned each of the master's debtors, and he began saying to the first, uh, how much do you owe uh, my master? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. You probably see in your margin what that literally uh, reads. Uh, and he said to him, take your bill, something like your note, 
and sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, and how much do you owe? And he said, a hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write 80. And his master praised the unrighteous manager because he had acted shrewdly. Now, when we come to verse eight, uh, it requires some interpretation. I believe that the parable ended there. His master praised the unrighteous manager because he had acted shrewdly. And at that point, uh, the Lord himself picks up uh, his teaching about the parable, his application. So the middle of verse eight, for the sons of this age are more shrewd in relation to their own kind than the sons of light. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by means of the wealth of unrighteousness. That word uh, is mammon, a familiar word to Bible students. It's an Aramaic term that came to stand for riches, uh, not always in a, a, a positive light. So I say to you, make friends for yourselves by means of the mammon of unrighteousness, so that when it fails, they will receive you into the eternal dwellings. He who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much, and he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth, who will entrust the true riches to you? And if you have not been faithful in the use of that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Every person at one time or another finds oneself in a bind. Some assortment of circumstances has turned against you, uh, stolen your peace, and replaced it with a sense of panic. Often our material well-being is in the crosshairs. Uh, what we had expected or hoped for fails to come to pass. Or, or signs begin to appear that there will be difficulties ahead that you are not prepared for. You dread them, and you do not know what to do in the event they transpire. Often the situation paralyzes us. Other times we try to ignore it and pretend it's not there. Uh, but the message of the parable the Lord gives in the first par few paragraphs of Luke 16 is that at times like that, a disciple of Jesus is to be astute and use all the wisdom and shrewdness we can muster to meet the coming crisis, and even more so as it concerns our use of money. That's one emphasis uh, found in these verses, but closely related in, to it are the importance of faithfulness in stewardship and the danger uh, the love of money poses. So the themes of the passage are several but related. Our wisdom in preparing for what the future holds, our stewardship, how trustworthy and faithful we are with what God has gifted us in the interim. Have you ever prayed, Lord, make me a better steward uh, of my money, of my time, of my uh, resources? And lastly, about a malady, the scriptures repeatedly warn against the love of money. Luke tells us at the uh, beginning that Jesus was directing the parable to the disciples, but we also know from verse 14 that the Pharisees were within listening distance, so there would be a lesson for them as well. He describes a rich man who had a manager over his estate. He's also called a steward. Uh, like Joseph, think uh, Joseph in Potiphar's 
house. Uh, his master had made him the supervisor over all that he owned uh, in the house and in the land holdings. Uh, Joseph had total responsibility over it all. Uh, Genesis 29, 6 states that with Joseph there, Potiphar did not concern himself with anything except the food which he ate. And that was the situation with this manager in uh, the parable. The details of the story would lead us to believe that the, the master was exceptionally wealthy uh, with vast land holdings. So that uh, uh, with the manager there, the owner was free to be away and pursue his various endeavors without concern of other things. But he received from some source or sources this troubling news that his manager, either by negligence or incompetence or perhaps even uh, with malice was squandering his possessions so that the owner resolved to relieve him of his position and he called him in to tell him he was firing him and he was demanding from him to bring back to him an accounting of the management of the estate. Well, that was a blow uh, to the steward's uh, peace of mind uh, but also gave him some time uh, to come up with a plan for this sudden crisis. His mind uh, raced as he considered what alternatives he had to fall back on because without his occupation, he would be destitute. Uh, physical labor uh, was not tenable. He was not fit enough for that. Uh, he was too proud to beg I know we love that song, Ain't Too Proud to Beg, <laughs> and can, and can uh, uh, associate with it, but he was too proud uh, to beg. Uh, Jesus described him as one who was desperate to come up with a plan to put in place that would relieve him of the predicament. And suddenly, it seems, he came up with one. I know what I shall do. I've got it. Uh, the perfect scheme that will bring me into the good graces of my master's clients after I've been terminated. He fixed on a plan by which he could quickly and secretly, for the master in the parable would not have approved of it, uh, reduce the debt owed by all those who were in debt to his master. There must have been many uh, of these debtors, but he mentions only uh, the two. As was typical at the time, it seems most of the rich master's holdings were in agriculture in, in, in this time of, of history, and the, the income from renting his land holdings out to farmers was a significant component of his wealth. So the steward uh, summoned uh, one of them uh, who traded in olive oil and then another whose crop was wheat. And this is how he worked his dishonest ruse. He began by asking each of them, how much do you owe my master? And the first debtor uh, responded, a hundred baths of oil. A, a bath equaled, uh, it's been figured, something between seven and a half and eight and a half gallons by today's measurements. So somewhere around uh, six, 800 gallons of oil, the, the fruit of some 146 olive trees, according to Jeremiah, who was a, 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 a mid 20th century uh, Bible scholar who focused on, on the parables. Jeremiah is often quoted. And the manager quickly directed him to take his note and write 50 instead. He asked another man the same question, uh, how much do you owe? And that debtor responded, a hundred uh, cores of wheat. Uh, a core equaled between 10 and 12 bushels, or a thousand plus uh, bushels in total, estimated to be the yield from about a hundred acres of, of farmable uh, land. So you can see the wealthy owner had significant uh, land holdings. These were no small enterprises encumbered by debt. And again, he said to him, take your note and write 80. 
Well, you may wonder uh, why he discounted the loan by 50% in the case of the oil measurement, but only by 20% in the case of the wheat. And the best explanation uh, is revealing and a reason for me spending a little time on it. And it gives us a clue to what the dishonest manager was actually doing. Uh, either the manager uh, himself, or likely with the knowledge of the owner, uh, they had uh, been charging interest on the loans, a practice that was forbidden according to Jewish law in such scriptures as Exodus 22:35, Leviticus 25, 36 and 37, Deuteronomy 15, 7 and 8, and other scriptures uh, in the Old Testament as well. It uh, especially applied to one's dealings with the poorer or those with lesser means for whom the interest added would have been an, a special a burden to them. Uh, but charging a fellow Jew interest, also known as usury, uh, was commonly and craftily rationalized by writing out the notes in terms of the commodity rather than in monetary figures. Uh, because it was easier to hide the interests that way. It's hard to lie with numbers. Numbers are there, they're black and white, but if you put it uh, in terms of the commodity, you can uh, sort of shimmy a little bit. So what the manager was now doing was repairing the dishonest practice by removing uh, the interest so that the owner would still be getting repaid the loan just without the interest. I hope you follow that. And, and the explanation for the difference between the 50% in the case of the oil and the 80% in the case of the wheat is likely to be found in one of two factors. Either the relative value of each in comparison to one another, or in the ease with which oil could be adulterated compared to wheat. And that was Leon Morris's explanation. And don't worry, I looked it up. Uh, to adulterate a commodity is to either dilute it, in the case of oil, or to add some kind of filter to it, in the case of wheat, which would have been more difficult uh, to hide. But the genius of the idea, whether you understood all that or not, I finally did, but uh, the genius of the idea was that the steward was endearing himself to a whole company of people who knew him, but would now look upon him as their benefactor and likely feel that they were in his debt now. Uh, the manager had been worried about his future uh, now he had a whole stable of new friends who owed him a favor. Uh, these, there would always be a room and a table set for him. And what was the master of the estate uh, to do once he understood what was uh, happening? Uh, he was in a pickle. Everybody's in a pickle in this story. Uh, but he was in a pickle now. Whether he was in on the hidden interest scam from the beginning or not, if he called his manager to task for the reduction, he would be implicated himself, uh, either as a collaborator or as now insensitive to the plight of the poor to whom the manager appeared especially generous. The only thing left for him to do was to join in the accolades and praise his manager, as we see in the first half of verse 8, not sincerely for anything truly praiseworthy he had done, of course, but as Jesus says, because he had acted shrewdly, uh, through clenched teeth probably. You clever devil, you got me. And here's one reason the parable has vexed so many in the past, perhaps you as you've read it in the past. It seems as though an obviously unrighteous man is receiving praise for his unrighteous deeds. 
But that's not really what is taking place. The, the master in the parable is not praising the manager for his unrighteous deeds, but for his astuteness in ascertaining the danger that lies ahead of him, taking it seriously, and planning how to escape it. There's a lot of lessons there uh, that we could spend some time working on. Uh, he, he was astute in ascertaining danger that lies in the future. He took it seriously, and he planned how to escape it. It stung the, the, the master to be outwitted, but he had to hand it to the man. He had shrewdly acted in his best interest and avoided the disastrous consequences of his own actions. And then uh, the Lord joins in, in a sense, uh, with the master of the parable in the second half of uh, verse 8. Now, uh, departing, leaving the parable, uh, in order to make his own interpretation and application. Jesus says, For the sons of this age are more shrewd in relation to their own kind than the sons of light. The sons of this age, uh, understood naturally, are men and women of the world living in this darkness they're not aware of but blind to, while living by their own lights, side by side, with the actual sons of light, who are those touched by God's grace, but who occasionally live as though they are of the other category. Do you recognize those people? <laughs> Our room is full of them, and I'm, I'm one of them. Uh, the sons of this age must live by their own wits, uh, deprived of spiritual light, and yet remarkably, even they apply themselves to solutions to life's threatenings. The manager is called by Jesus, I want you to pay special attention to, the unrighteous manager. Now that's a word that we understand intuitively uh, mostly. It, it refers to what is not upright uh, or to a person who is devoid of the uprightness that God possesses and gives as a gift to those he adopts as his own. It can't be a coincidence that the word Adikia, or its root form, appears consecutively several times in the following verses. Twice in verses 9 and 11 for the unrighteous wealth or, or mammon, and then also twice in verse 10 as an antonym for faithfulness. Several of the commentators, I don't think this is insignificant, and I hate to drop Qumran on you, but several of the commentators have traced this particular usage of the word back to the literature of Qumran, in which it often stands for the character of the age, or what is considered simply as worldly. I think if we think of it in terms of worldly, we'll, we'll, we'll have a better chance of understanding it, denoting the standing characteristic of this world, corrupted as it is by sin. And used in that manner, the steward is simply a worldly man who acts in worldly fashion, that is sinfully. That's how people of the world uh, behave, which is why many translate the wealth of unrighteousness as just worldly wealth. And as I read it, that's what I do. I translate it in my mind, worldly wealth. That's going to have application for us in verse 9, but we don't want to ignore the implications of the Lord's comment in verse 8 about the importance of acting shrewdly. Here are the two great categories that divide mankind. Are those who have a relationship with God that continually promotes in them conduct pleasing to God that is honoring to Him, and those who live only for the world. They are the sons of this age. We are side by side with them every day. Uh, most of us who are still working, we're surrounded by them, the sons of this age. That's who we come into, con if, we're, if we're blessed and fortunate, we, we, we have some friendly folks with us, but uh, the sons of this age are uh, surrounding us. Uh, and yet the sons of this age are more shrewd. 
you'd have to think about this, but you might come to that conclusion. Most of them are more shrewd. They tend to be more adept, we might say, at recognizing real threats the future holds for their well-being and taking action toward, to ward them off and, and prepare for them. Uh, while too many of the sons of light uh, live mindlessly adrift without concern or notice of impending danger. James Boyce described it as being trapped in indifference by sinful neglect, with the result that some people become more foolish about their self-preservation than animals. Uh, geese, he observed by example, and other birds fly south when winter comes. Uh, rodents will store up for winter. Some animals hibernate. But human beings proceed in a manner they know is foolish and characteristically fail to make adequate provision for their future. And Boyce saw it as the main idea of the passage, this neglectful, laissez-faire attitude about what the future holds. It is less than shrewd, less than astute, it's dumb. And Christ now applies the parable in verse 9, I always like to say, I always say, look down now at verse 9. Uh, he applies it in verse 9 across human experience, uh, unfolding the spiritual significance that our worldly conduct signifies. And it's at this point that the Lord begins to bring in our use of money and other forms of the world's currency as it relates to shrewdness and conduct and stewardship in general of all that ultimately comes as a gift from God. So we should read the verse again. Verse 9, and I say to you, uh, this is the Lord making application from the parable. I say to you, make friends for yourselves by means of the wealth of unrighteousness so that when it fails, they will receive you into the eternal dwellings. Again, not the easiest verse uh, to interpret. In my notes on verse 9, <clears throat> after my first go through, you know what it's like to have a first go through through a passage of scripture. Let's see here, what do we got? And uh, it's, it's mainly questions. What's this? What's this? What's this? But uh, in, in my overview, not even taking into account how we're to make friends for ourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, I wrote it down. What is it? Uh, who are they? What are the eternal dwellings? But if we understand unrighteous wealth in the sense I described earlier as characterizing all wealth in this world, because ultimately it is tainted by the character of the age we live in, then we can understand the verse as directed toward how a follower of Christ should use and invest the worldly wealth God has given him or her. Uh, Jesus had no naive understanding about uh, money. He knew it better than anybody. His perception of it was divine. But he also knew that his disciples were to make use for, of it for the kingdom. And when challenged by his enemies about paying taxes, for example, uh, you remember what he replied, render under, unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. He had identified a use of the world's wealth as tainted as it might be as that was legitimate and necessary. But here the verse uh, makes plain that Jesus has in mind the most noble use of one's money in spending it to benefit other people, especially the needy. In another place, in Matthew chapter 25, in the, in the story of the sheep and the goats judgment, the, the Lord, remember, identified the righteous as those who fed the hungry, gave the thirsty something to drink, clothed the naked, and visited the sick and the imprisoned. That's a good way to use the world's money and at the same time, in consequence, make friends for oneself. We will not have it forever. 
So we should use it discreetly and with careful intent. One day it will fail, uh, meaning we will die and, and go to heaven. And there, these friends we made on earth through the use of our worldly wealth will be there to welcome us and, and receive us into the eternal dwellings. God gives us the worldly wealth, and it is wisdom to spend it for those he loves here on earth. I like the New English Bible version of this verse. Use your worldly wealth to win friends for yourselves so that when money is a thing of the past, you may be welcomed into an eternal home. In verses 10 through 12 now, uh, the Lord stays on point and addresses the importance of faithful stewardship of the worldly assets God gives to us. And just as in the previous uh, verse and in the parable that preceded it, the prospect of a future accounting is in view so that an overriding lesson throughout the passage is that followers of Jesus Christ should conduct themselves always with the future in mind. Do you do that? We should do that. We should conduct ourselves with the future in mind. The theme of stewardship in the here and now would have formed a connection in the disciples' minds with how the dishonest manager had not been a good steward and ultimately had to scramble to protect himself. Now, a contrast is introduced uh, to make his point. Hear it, he who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much and he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. So that's a contrast, see? And it just happens to be the way the world works as well. Uh, faithfulness is not measured by the size of the amount you have in trust, but is often tested by size. The reason is that faithfulness arises out of what one is through and through, uh, no matter the size in view. Dan gave an illustration of this in his sermon on this passage several years ago. He had heard it as a young man and had not forgotten it, and I can't think of a better one. It concerned a man who was vying for a better position in his business, and the man uh, who was charged with filling the position took him to lunch at a cafeteria. As they were going through the line, uh, they approached the cash register and the senior man uh, noticed uh, the applicant uh, slide a, a teeny weeny uh, pad of butter uh, under the edge of his plate so that the cashier wouldn't see it and charge him for it. We don't go to the cafeteria anymore, but you can remember you had a, a roll and a pat of butter, and you, they charged you for the pat of butter. And that was all he needed to know about the man applying. If he couldn't be trusted to be honest about such a small amount of money, he knew he would be dishonest when faced with weightier decisions. A person's soul is not divided, but a unity. Jesus then applies the contrast in verses 11 and 12. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth or worldly wealth, who will entrust the true riches to you? And if you've not been faithful in the use of that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? So even with worldly wealth, uh, think of whatever examples you can conjure, and I mean it. Boats, uh, home decor, fashion, automobiles, um, the arts, hobbies, the gym, even worldly wealth. The eye of the master is on his children. We are stewards even of the seemingly mundane and harmless categories of worldly wealth. 
they're contrasted with true riches. They're not to be compared to the worldly, these true riches. They are apparently beyond description. He doesn't describe them, but they must be heavenly in nature, things which, as the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered into the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. What we lack, though, in our attempts to describe them is balanced by our understanding that one set of treasure is of this world, earthy, earthly, and therefore transient, but these other true riches are eternal and they'll never fade away. And there is a connection. I'm not sure I fully understand it. There is a connection between our stewardship of the worldly and how we will be rewarded in heaven. I know that's hard to get our arms around when we start talking about uh, rewards, uh, but it reminds us of the parable of the minas that we'll run into in Luke chapter 19. The mina was a common Greek coin of quite a bit of value, and uh, the master gave to one uh, ten minas to another five minas, and uh, they would were rewarded according to what they did uh, with those minas. They'll be rewarded when he returns. They'll be rewarded in the future. Verse 12 gives the second application, uh, faithfulness in the use of that which is another's uh, will constitute the measure of what will later be given you, which is your own. Uh, worldly wealth doesn't really belong to disciples, in other words. Uh, they hold it un in trust from God. One of the great temptations in our modern wealthy world is for a man or woman to consider the worldly wealth that has come their way and fall into the deep, dangerous hole of pride of attainment. To think that this is by my sweat that this wealth, this worldly wealth has come to me. It's by my ingenuity it's by my plans. It's by my getting up at such and such in the morning and slaving all day that all this has, has come to me. It's a deep, dangerous hole of pride. The money we think we own, the wealth we consider our accumulation has not come from ourselves and does not belong to us. It is ever and always a gift and stewardship from God. And if we make a mess of it, we will learn in the future that, our future that our failure has consequences. Kent Hughes observed that one's use of money and spirituality are inseparably bound together. That's a dynamic statement. One's use of money and spirituality are inseparably bound together. They're also dangerously in competition with each other. And that's the final warning the Lord issues in verse 13 and almost word by word repetition of the same warning in the Sermon on the Mount. No servant, no servant can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. You cannot. There, there's a reason. This is one of the most quoted verses in the Bible. It's because it's a temptation that is common to us all. Only God can be on the throne of your life. A person may try to substitute the accumulation of the world's wealth as his object of worship and think for a time that he succeeded, but time will prove him deadly wrong. The more common thing is for a believer to attempt serving both. Uh, to be what he thinks is a superlative example of accomplishing both total allegiance to God and wholesale devotion to gaining wealth. And Jesus' stern message is that that's impossible. You cannot 
You cannot do that. There will be uh, what one commentator, William Hendrickson, what, called an, inev an inevitable psychological tension that is built up in the soul of a person who imagines for a while that he'll be able to love and serve both. But the stress will build up, and sooner or later, he'll begin to show where his real allegiance lies. Either the one master or the other will win out. The loving Father who has shown us so much grace and mercy and loved us so much he gave his son for us demands and deserves our exclusive loyalty. God despises our idols, but he rewards our stewardship. If not in this life, then in the life to come, he would have us learn from the dishonest steward who was also shrewd, consider what the future holds and be astute in preparing for it, you'll be rewarded. You'll be rewarded. And for any who are listening who have not yet trusted in Jesus Christ and become his disciple, the lesson for you is urgent. You are in a fix yourselves. Uh, your sin has put you there. But there is a solution and it's in Jesus. Think about your future. Show yourself astute. Believe in Christ who came to earth and gave himself a sacrifice for sins. It'd be your sins if you trust in him. Let me close. Father, thank you for this wonderful parable. I hope, Lord, and trust that we've got it right today. Uh, but the message is right. Uh, we should be astute about the future. We should be good stewards of the money you've given us. We should uh, be careful to use it uh, discreetly and wisely and with thought to others who are more needy than we are perhaps. Uh, but most of all, Lord, we're thankful that by your Holy Spirit you have uh, brought us to the knowledge of the solution for our dilemma. Uh, you've brought us to Christ, your Son, and given us life in Him so that we have hope for the future and we look forward uh, to be welcomed uh, by you first and foremost uh, when we die into heaven, uh, but also uh, by many who uh, have been the beneficiaries of the work that we have done in friendship with them. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen.